All right, welcome everyone. I hope you've been enjoying Recon as much as I have. So today we talked about how to build distributed systems, write distributed systems, operate them, how to test them. If you haven't seen in a Sombra's talk on how to test distributed systems, definitely do that. We talked about how time works in distributed systems and what the future is. So let's talk about how we benchmark distributed systems. So how many of you have done one or many benchmarks ever? Awesome, okay. So you probably recognize a lot of these pitfalls and we'll be able to relate to that. <laughs> That's possible too. <laughs> okay, so why do, we write, just, um, why do we write benchmarks? We write them in order to understand the performance of the system. And if we set up benchmarking correctly, then hours, days, months of effort will result in a worse performing application and upset customers as well as our inability to detect why our application is performing worse because Benchmark will tell us, well, it's doing better. So who am I? I'm Isla Greenberg. I work at Google and I'm the maintainer of Loom, which is a um, graph algorithms and visualization library written in Clojure. So I do that in my spare time. And today we'll talk about benchmarking and how you're doing it wrong. And hey, these are the things I've also done wrong, so we're in the same boat here. So there's right way and wrong way to do benchmarks. Let's start with a simple case. Stopwatches. In order to write good benchmarks, one needs to be full stack. So one needs to understand the front end and the back end of the system, as well as the bytecode internal representation emitted by the compiler and the machine code generated by their code generator, the operating system level, and the hardware level, all the way down to the gates, and the device physics, if you have to. And since most, if not all of us, are doing distributed systems, network layer, understanding of how network layer works becomes essential. And let's not forget about our users. How our users utilizing our applications is incredibly important in figuring out what the benchmark should do. And oftentimes, we don't have access to all this knowledge because it takes focused effort into acquiring this knowledge in the first place and sometimes years, decades of experience. But we can write better, more correct benchmarks anyway. So to make sure we're all on the same page, what is a benchmark? Well, to me, benchmark measures how fast the program runs. And of course, there are quality benchmarks, which tell us the data coverage, the quality of the data, uh, resulting data set. But quality in that context differs from problem domain to problem domain. So today we'll specifically focus on measuring latency and benchmarking latency. In business, benchmark is when you compare your process to a goal and when you compare your process to industry's best practices. So you might wonder, how does this definition relate to this other one we just discussed? Well, benchmark Benchmarks allow us to focus not only on the performance of the program, but also on performance goal. So how fast is fast enough so that our users are happy and our costs on the infrastructure and resources are kept down? So today, the talk will be in four parts. First, we'll talk about how not to write benchmarks, and we'll look at a contrived example of the benchmark. Then we'll break it down by looking at common pitfalls in setting up of the benchmark, and interpreting of the results. Specifically, we'll look at three aspects. We'll see how you're wrong about machines, you're wrong about stats, and you're wrong about what matters. So then we'll talk about how to become less wrong, how to avoid those pitfalls. And last, to conclude, we'll have fu some fun with React. So a lot of these examples, I'm not going to name products or particular um, experiences, but those are all very real life examples that I've encountered or my colleagues have encountered. So let's get to it. Let's talk about how not to write benchmarks. Imagine you have a website serving images and images are slowest to load, so you want to benchmark those. So a request comes in to the server and then the server has two options. It can add this fetch the image from the cache, or you can fetch it from S3, or the cloud, or what have you. Okay, so in order to benchmark this, what we'll do is we'll measure access to one image 1,000 times, 
and we'll measure latency for each access. And we'll start measuring latency immediately. We'll do three runs, find the mean, and we'll do this on, in our dev environment because our production cluster is too busy doing our production workload. Okay, so what's wrong with this benchmark? Well, let's take it apart one step at a time. When it comes to machines, you know nothing, John Snow. <laughs> we in our industry deal a lot with caches, and it's ca we have caches in all the different layers of our applications and systems. And our favorite way to approach any kind of latency problem seems to be just put a cache on it. And it's caches all the way down. So usually caches are structured in a hierarchy, and only one cache level is accessed at a time by your benchmark, by a system. For instance, in our setup, so the web request comes to the server, server will either talk to the cache or to S3 to fetch the image, or it can talk to its own memory, but only one of the locations will be accessed. Let's look at caches in processors in greater detail. So what we can have is we have for each core L1 cache for data and instructions, and then we have L2 cache. And then we have L3 cache shared across all the cores. Okay, so now also here, if the data fits into your L1 cache and it's located there, the processor will fetch the data from L1 cache. If it's not there, it will look into L2 cache and so on. However, not all caches are structured in a hierarchy. Imagine the following scenario. So you have a bloated binary, which means that there are many different co-paths that the user could take. And what is gonna happen is that you can't cache what instructions are going to be taken next. So you'll keep missing the instruction cache. Now, no matter how much you tune your memcache server, the instruction cache is your bottleneck. So knowing what your architecture is like is very important. So for most benchmark, you're benchmarking one particular cache level. Let's look at the following example of a program. So here what we do is we do random access of memory within address range. And the N on the X axis is, you can think about it as the number of elements in the query set. And the, X, um, and the Y axis on the left is latency, the lower the better. And the Y axis on the right, not marked here, is actually number of cache misses. So we do random access of memory to defeat the prefetcher, which is a clever hardware technique that allows you to figure out what the access patterns are and then hide the latencies by prefetching some of the memories so that you can retrieve it much faster when requested. So what we notice here is that we have roughly four different modes that our performance is. The performance is the black line. So if we look at what caches do is, we notice that up to 32,000 elements, we fit all the data into L1 cache, and then we start missing L1 cache, and we no observe the effects due to L1 cache effects. And then um, up to 128,000 elements, all the data fits into L2 cache, and then we start missing. And when we have more than 8 million elements, we start missing the L3 cache, so the performance is due to the effects from L3 cache. And the small artifact you see in between is actually due to translation local side buffer misses. Okay, so what did we do wrong in our benchmark? Here's, well, by accessing one image 1,000 times, it just, it doesn't give us what we want to be actually benchmarking. So what we should think about is, what's the goal of the benchmark? It depends on what you want to know. So if you want to measure distribution of requests coming in to your system, for instance, you're accessing 90% of the time top five images, and then 10% of the time the rest of the images, you'd want to model your benchmark to do precisely that. And if you want to find access time to a cache, then make sure that all the images that you access are located in the cache. And if you want to measure access to S3, then make sure every single image you access is not located in the cache. Okay, so now let's talk about warm up and timing. If you're writing your systems in, on a JVM language, for instance, Java, Scala, Clojure, what you will see is that your program will be executed in three modes. First, it will be executed in interpreter mode, in which um, the JIT compiler will just be observing what you're executing. 
then when it finds hard paths, it will compile them and it will be executing a mixed mode. So both interpreted and compiled mode. And then over time, this system will reach steady state in which most, if not all, code will be executed in compiled mode. Another example of a warm-up is cache filling. So when you start up your application, it will take some time for it to cache the relevant data that you're accessing most frequently. And it will take time to fill up all the caches. And warm-up is the cost you pay once per long-running application. So when you run your benchmark matters tremendously. So if you want to find out the failover behavior, the only thing you're interested in is really is the warm-up behavior. So you will measure the warm-up times, and then once the application reaches steady state, you're, you don't want to measure the rest of that. However, if you want to measure the steady state of a long-running application, you would want to discard the warm-up times and look at the steady state um, latencies. So in this case, by starting to measure this immediately, what we'll see is that latency results will be skewed to the higher latency side. So w this shouldn't really be part of our benchmark because we're interested in how long it takes when th all the caches have been filled and the warm-up phase is over. Now let's discuss periodic interference. Periodic interference is when you have constructive or destructive interference due to periodic processes, two or more different periodic processes happening. So on this plot, what you see is you see the plot of the um, heap taken with JVisual VM. So the blue line is the um, size of the heap, and the area underneath it is the number, uh, the amount of used heap, and the orange line is the pre-allocated heap. So now the peak that you see is when the GC activity kicks in. So garbage collector starts collecting, and then at the dip is when it ends. So now it reduces the amount of memory, frees it up. OK. So if you were to measure the duration of active requests during the garbage collector activity, what you're going to see is that requests are taking much longer than they would take otherwise. Similarly, if you're measuring throughput, uh, the number of concurrent requests during an indexing operation, every time it happens to be during indexing operation, you will see much lower throughput than you would see otherwise. Or if your event, the periodic interface is not exactly synced, then you will see data all over the place. So if you measure right before you see activity, and then next time you measure right after, and the next time you measure in between, it will look like the, uh, your results are just all over the place. So by measuring latency for each access, it's just it doesn't give us enough information, and we don't really know if we're having periodic interference. Better approach is to measure latency and throughputs so you could see whether you're experiencing some of that. And also, it will tell you whether you're having coordinated emission, which we'll discuss in more detail a little later in this talk. So now let's talk about the differences in test and production uh, environments. Setting up a second production environment is very expensive and um, almost always prohibitive to a lot of us. And really, it's not going to be a problem if something takes 90% of the time in your test environment. It's probably going to take similar amount of time in the production environment, so you're going to still see the same bottlenecks. However, for some of the more subtle effects, like cache effects with bigger RAM, you're not, you can't really model for what, how it's going to behave in the production. Also, if you have different compute powers, you, you'll just not be comparing apples to apples because now your production pipeline will get, be getting through data much faster, so you'll have different buffer sizes, queuing will be behaving very differently, and so on. So if you can match up the environment as closely as possible for your benchmark and for production, or if you can't, verify to yourself that this is something that is not going to cause you to get meaningless results. So by doing this, on environments may not be really sufficient for us and may give us inconclusive results. Another much more subtle thing when benchmarking is power mode changes. So you may be familiar with dynamic frequency scaling or CPU throttling. Um, also, um, one of the examples is Intel's speed step technology. So what that would do is that your CPU may be running at 1 gigahertz, and then it will power it up to 4 gigahertz, and at some point it will decide to power it down to 2 gigahertz. And that's something you can measure. And just knowing whether that's something that happens in your production and in benchmark, and taking that into account um, it will be a much better approach than just not knowing about it. 
Okay, so we just talked about common pitfalls when reasoning about machines. So let's talk about stats. So one of the common pitfalls that I've observed and um, I think we all do is uh, not having enough data. So by having too few samples, we may include some outliers and then we don't really know what our distribution is like. So you may wonder how many runs is enough for our benchmark to have conclusive results? Well, that depends on your application, but there are some good approaches you can take. So let's look at the following plot. On the x-axis, we have time. Uh, you can think about it as number of runs, number of samples. And um, y-axis is latency. And we have two different programs. So let's focus first on the top of the um, plot. So blue dots are the stable samples. Um, and the red dots are the medias that we took from those samples. And what we see is that up to, ten t uh, up to time 10, it's not very stable. It goes back and forth. And then, but towards run, number 20 and 40, it starts stabilizing, giving us more meaningful results. So in this case, maybe at least 20, 40 runs will be sufficient. Now, for the bottom graph, the purple dots are the medians, and the green dots are the samples that we took. What we see is that it goes, uh, the median goes really crazy at the beginning, and like dips to 22 at time three, and then goes up and down. And around 40 runs, it starts stabilizing. So another, um, so just knowing when it starts stabilizing and being able to look at that um, is very important. It also depends on whether you're interested in exploring the long latency. So for some of the work that I've done, we were interested in artifacts that we may see many days later. So we ran our benchmark for many, many days. However, if you're not interested in that, then you may run it for much shorter time. So just know what the time scales are that you're interested in. So by doing three runs, just simply doesn't give us enough information. Normally, we have a normal distribution. However, due to um, the different effects that we measure and different layers of the system interacting with each other, we may not have a normal Gaussian distribution. So in a normal distribution, mean and standard deviation is all you need to know about your data set to be able to reason about it. However, mean is not robust enough when you have outliers. So if you have 10 requests of one millisecond and one request of 10 milliseconds, the mean will tell your requests are of two milliseconds. Now, median will take this result and sort it out and take the middle point and it will tell you that request takes one milliseconds, which is a much better representative of our sample set. So mean is not robust enough in the presence of Outliers, similarly, percentiles are much more uh, robust. They show distribution much more robust in the presence of outliers compared to the standard deviation. So by finding mean, that really gives us very misleading data and will probably cause us to do the wrong things when we optimize our applications later. Another problem with distributions, though, is that they may have many modes. So usually when we talk about our data, our latencies, we want to summarize to a few points. We don't want to just spit out the whole distribution of raw data. So what we'll do is we'll take you know, the 50th percentile, 90th, maybe 95th, 99th percentile. Well, the thing about the 50th percentile is that all it tells us is that half of the time we're doing better and half of the time we're doing worse, which isn't really saying much. Um, it's not a very helpful thing for us to know. And also, it could be completely useless if we have multimodal distribution. So imagine the following case. So we have our latency measured in milliseconds on the x-axis, a number of occurrences going up the y-axis. And as we expect, latency of 4 milliseconds, which is our 50th percentile, happens much more frequently than latency of 10 milliseconds, which is our 99th percentile. OK, so far so good. So imagine what this distribution looks like. This is what it actually looks like. So in this case, 50th and 99th percentile don't really tell us much about what the representative uh, data points are in our distribution. Maybe the 25th and 75th percentile are a much better way for us to talk about this data because those are the um, peaks that we have. Those are the most occurrences that we have. 
Um, so it's always important to look at the histograms when reasoning about your distributions and plot the actual distributions to see what the modalities may be. There are actually also algorithms you can run on your data to figure out um, what the modality of your data is. One of them is called Silverman's uh, mode detection algorithm. Matt Adareth wrote a fantastic blog post on explaining how that works and made it very accessible to everyone, so I highly recommend it. Now let's talk about Atlas. This is my favorite topic. Um, I feel like I've found and solved many more bugs and <coughs> fixed many more bugs than I did by just looking at non-outliers. And I was actually able to find bugs both in production code and in my own benchmark just by investigating the outliers. But unfortunately, they don't get much love. So imagine the following scenario. You have a client sending requests. And the server usually responds within one millisecond. So we will send a request to the server at time zero, get the response back at one. We'll send another request at time 10 milliseconds, get the response back um, at time 11. Another one at 20, but we don't hear back from the server until time 100, because maybe it's going under DC pause, just became unavailable, what have you. So now, what happens is that afterwards, we see the same kind of pattern that we would expect, the server responding in one millisecond. Okay, so what happens here is when we get our data back, our one request took 80 milliseconds. We toss it out because it's just an outlier. So, and then we just go ahead happy with our lives and reasoning about our data. So what happened here is that during those 80 milliseconds, we missed out on sending eight more requests. So we don't know what our distribution is. So we omitted some data. Also, instead of having our client send every 10 milliseconds data, regardless of whether the server responded or not, we coordinated with the server's response. So now what this means is we, um, we have the coordinated emission happening in this case. Gil Tenney's, um t goes into much more detail into this and he's talk how not to measure latency. I highly recommend it and he explains it much, more, uh, much better. So if you're interested in learning more, um, I highly recommend it. Another thing that outliers do for us is they reveal to us whether we're missing SLAs. SLAs are service level agreements between you and the client it's, um, promising some delivery times. Also, because a lot of us, all of us, are working at scale, if you have something that only happens 1% of the time, so 1 out of 100 times, and, you have a, and it takes 10 times as long, and your web page, say, has 100 images being pulled, what this means is that every single user will be affected by this 10x latency. So just probabilistically, as we work at bigger scales, all these outliers become a much bigger issue than they are when we just look at our data. So we talked about common pitfalls and stats, and we talked about machines. Let's talk about how you're wrong about what matters. I think um, a lot of us who um, learn more about um, performance engineering, um, a lot of enthusiastic performance engineers get really excited to optimize their program, just make it go really, really fast, and make it awesome. So this is, we commonly refer to this as premature optimization when we start optimizing before we actually know what to optimize. And I couldn't have put it better than Knuth. So what Knuth says is that programmers waste enormous amounts of time thinking about the speed of non-critical parts of their programs. We should forget about small efficiencies 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. Often, even most seasoned programmers can't quite predict where the bottleneck of the program will be. Now, another common issue when setting up benchmark is benchmarks is using unrepresentative workloads. So you may see that your application runs just fine when you're benchmarking it, like you see pretty decent latencies. And then in real life, other services may take up the resources, so you start seeing very horrible latencies. If we benchmark our um, web server serving images with um, 200 kilobyte images, like the thumbnails, instead of two mega images that we actually serve in production workload because we just want to get out our data as fast as possible. Well, it's all very hard to actually model how our system will behave with a bigger images and what other effects we may see. 
since we're doing distributed systems, we probably have queues and buffers everywhere. And if run for long enough time, you may see that your, some of your buffers will be slowly filling up, and then the whole system grinds to a halt and stops working. So when setting up benchmarks, you should really think about what the timelines you're interested in. If this kind of buffer bloat happens once a month, and you're de redeploying every week, then it's not really valuable or important for you or economically viable for you to just look into this kind of uh, performance, this kind of issue. However, you should probably go and fix your buffer bloat issue as soon as you have time. So you should focus on what matters and on the focus on the time scales that you're actually interested in operating in. Okay, another common issue is the uh, memory pressure and accounting for it. So if you're writing in a garbage collected language, usually what you will see is that you will want to garbage collect right after you set up for your benchmark to not taking into account all the you know, creation of objects during the setup time. And you don't want to take that into account. However, after your benchmark finished, what you would want to do is you want to force another garbage collection, but this time measure it because it will give you an estimate of a memory footprint of your program. If you're benchmarking a library, though, it may be very hard to account for that because you may see garbage collector pressure due to other parts of the system when you integrate your library with the rest of the system. And, of course, we have load balancers. You probably have a load balancer um, in your distributed systems. And naturally, you would expect that load balancers will introduce extra latencies. They may, may also make your long tail latency worse. And they may also hurt your throughput if you choose the wrong load balancing strategy. For example, um, with round robin uh, strategy for load balancing, what you will see is that it's subject to periodic interference and also coordinated emission. So it's much more prone to those issues. And it's important to know whether you're interested in measuring just one subpart of your system or you, want to, uh, or you need to know the end-to-end -end latency so that you see actually those effects of requests waiting to be scheduled in the load balancer and all the queue times. And if you stake the future of your company on this benchmark, you better make sure it's reproducible. Okay, so we talked about um, different uh, pitfalls in three different aspects. So let's talk about how to avoid those pitfalls and write better benchmarks. So when setting up the benchmark, I think the most important thing to think about is what are the user actions? How are our users utilizing our applications, not how we envision for them to utilize it? So use the real data on what users do on, in your system. And benchmarks don't really give you this magical answer that, say, database X is better than database Y. What they tell you is that database X is better than Y for a very particular workload Z with trade-offs and constraints a, B, and C. Thank you, I appreciate it. So, so what are the, some of the tools that we have in our toolkit? One of them is profile before optimizing, profile before benchmarking. What profiling will tell you is how long did you spend on each uh, function and what are the um, functions that you call most frequently. That would also tell you how your users are utilizing your application. Another one is um, code instrumentation, including instrumenting your code in production. So just including the code for measuring latency every time you enter a function and every time you exit the function, how long it took, and then saving all that information somewhere, combined with aggregating over logs in post facto to figure out what, how long you spend on each thing is actually much better than doing real-time latency tracking. Well, it's much easier to do that correctly. And it's also less prone to coordinate emission. Another thing you may do is um, doing tracing, distributed tracing, like Zipkin, Dapper. What those will tell you is any time request comes into the server, it will register which machines it got bounced around and which functions it called and how long it spent on each. And then it will give you this view of how your system performs and what it does. 
So when talking about benchmarks, we can't really avoid the topic of micro-benchmarks. You've probably seen read a lot of different blog posts talking about how they micro-benchmark a particular part of the system. So let's talk about them. So micro-benchmarks by their nature just benchmark a particular piece of code, usually a single operation. And to me, micro-benchmarks are a blessing and a curse. They're a very quick and cheap way to set them up um, because they don't require this thorough scientific approach to setting up the benchmarks and reasoning and getting as much data as possible about all your different layers of the system. And they answer very narrow questions very well. So you may wonder, um, is it quicker for me to use merge sort or quick sort when sorting my data? But they often produce misleading results. And they're not really representative of your program. So you should put micro trust in your micro benchmarks. So let's talk about some of the common pitfalls specifically um, in micro benchmarks. One of them is choosing your end. So when you do a single operation, it's common to not consider all the different data set sizes. Remember this graph from a little earlier? So depending on which, um, depending on the data set size, we could fit in different um, cache layers and we saw different performance measurements. So you may find that merge sort is much better if your data fits into L1 cache and then quick sort is better for everything else. If you're micro benchmarking a tight loop that does some write to a file or anything else uh, from a, a side effect, then make sure that you measure that and don't just toss that away. Another thing that micro is especially prone to is clock resolution. So if your uh, clock resolution is of one millisecond and your function takes 2.4 milliseconds, then what you will measure is actually two milliseconds and then three, two, three milliseconds. And there are statistical ways to figure out that your function actually takes 2.4 milliseconds, but it's harder to get right. So a good approach to do this is measure many, many iterations and start measuring at the zeroth iteration and finish measuring at the last iteration and then just divide that up by a number of iterations. Now in um, Java Doc 7, I believe, uh, for get current millis, they actually warn you that some of the operating systems may not give you um, finer than 10 millisecond resolution for the clocks. So it's good to be aware of that. Another common pitfall is um, not knowing that that code elimination happened. So this is an optimization done by compilers uh, where the compilers will figure out which part of code is never reachable, is not reachable or never executed, and then toss that away and never execute that. Um, and if you have like a JIT compiled language, what you may see is that you're not executing most of your program, so it will just toss that away. And now you're left with a very different program from the one you started out with. And also it's important to remember to do constant work per iteration if you're doing this. So imagine you have a tree and you're putting values into it and you're reading from it, and the tree grows slowly, uh, logarithmically in fact. And it may not seem like an issue, but the thing is the tree of 1,000 elements is three times as slow as the tree of 10 elements. So if you're doing iterations and, summing it up, and then dividing that by number of iterations, you get a very different result from what you think you're getting. So there are many really awesome resources uh, for knowing how to do benchmarks better from people who have been doing it for a really long time, so I highly recommend it. I'll post the slides online so you don't have to memorize it. You're also welcome to use the best search engine that there is. <laughs> so now, um, let's talk about how I had fun with React. Now note that I'm not calling this benchmarking because this was, you should do this much more thoroughly if you want to do this and much more scientifically. So I just wanted to see if I could get something of an interesting signal. And actually when I was benchmarking, I confirmed that my medians looked stable and my data looked stable to actually take that in, uh, into account. So I'd like to take a chance to thank uh, Chris Michael John, David Greenberg, and especially Tom Santero for helping us set this up. Um, Unfortunately, I've never had good luck for, um, with setting up anything out of the box. It just never works for me for some reason. So thanks to very thorough, solid expertise of Tom Santera, I was actually able to have a React cluster up and running. So OK, so let's, let's get to it. So we have a um, SSD of 30 
gigabytes. I did this on AWS. Um, I had the machines of N3 large, and I had the React version of 1.4.2, Ubuntu of 12.04. I had six nodes in my React cluster. One was dedicated to running Basho Bench, um, so I used Basho Bench for benchmarking it, and another one, um, other five are just for the database itself. I had four byte keys and 10 kilobyte values. What I wanted to know is if I varied number of keys in my database, could I see similar cache effects that we saw earlier with a program that was doing random access uh, of memory? So this is what I got. So on the x-axis, what you see is the number of keys growing exponentially. And on the y-axis, you see latency measured in microseconds. And then we see these two interesting areas. This one, uh, between 1,000 and 4,000 keys, and this one, um, from 128,000 and onwards. So now, this effect that you see between 3 to 15 keys um, is actually something interesting and definitely worth looking into and actually doing a much more thorough job of looking into it. But let's do this. So now, AWS um, tells us what machines to use for um, their M3 instances. And it's actually um, Intel Xeon A5, so I'll go online and look at the uh, specifications. And it tells me that L3 cache is of 25 megabytes. Coincidentally, um, as we reach 4,000 keys, that ends up being, taking up 25 megabytes. Um, so it was interesting to see that we start slowly increasing and filling up our three cache, and then we filled it up, and then um, we continue slowly increasing. And then at 128,000 keys, we start increasing rapidly. So I'm speculating that this is due to the fact that um, of what the benchmark did. So what it did is uh, it did random reads and writes 50% of the time. And I think what we're doing here is we're unable to start caching effectively because we're just doing random accesses. And so um, this is why we are doing worse and worse and worse at caching and um, the latency starts growing very quickly. Okay, so if now we'll be concluding and if you were to take anything out of this talk, I think it's, it should be the following three things. It's caches all the way down. And most caches are structured hier hierarchically. And your benchmark will always be accessing a particular one level of cache. So make sure you know what your architecture is to figure out whether you're looking and optimizing the proper cache level, whether you're looking in the right place. And if you're doing any um, bench micro benchmarking or you want to know how the caches behave, make sure to vary your data set size so you get that distribution that we looked at. Another one is outliers. Outliers carry much more informational density than any other data we get that fits within our expectations. Outliers tell us where our theory is wrong, where our expectations are wrong. They are a very strong signal, and they should be investigated very carefully. So as I mentioned, I found a lot of bugs, many more bugs than I did otherwise by investigating those outliers. And I was able to fix my production code and fix my benchmark to do the correct thing. And the third takeaway is the workload. So if you were to imagine that you know, we built the truck and we optimize it to be really good on decent work condition, uh, decent road conditions, and you know, carry some load, um, and now it's doing great, and then we give it this workload, which is the application running in production, and which is not optimized at all and not even meant to carry so many people in bags, and definitely those, not those kind of road conditions. What we're going to do is we're going to um, spend so much time in vain trying to do something better in, in an environment that doesn't matter to us, that is not a representative of our real production environment. That is it for today. I'll take now any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, let, let's go with the front row first, and then we'll get to you. Uh -huh. I'm sure Google has some unique experience testing really big systems. Mm -hmm. Is there any place you could go to look at like, double techniques that they might be doing that that level of scale is possible? Like, like what they might be doing? Yeah. Like, 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 like
Um, good question. So the first place I would look is just research.google.com, like where they post all their research papers. Um, I think that would be the um, place where they are comfortable publicly discussing. So, yeah, um, a lot of these approaches, though, is something just, you know, just good practices, and they get you as far as you need to go. So, mm -hmm. okay. There was another question. Yep. Yeah. Um, you're saying that you've learned a lot from kind of investigating the outlet. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. So uh, to repeat the question, uh, the question was, what techniques do you use to actually investigate those outliers to figure out what went wrong? So um, using traces and just logging your data so that you can go back uh, to it and look at it retro uh, retrospectively and figure out what might have happened is um, a good way to set up because when you do real time, you toss out the data as soon as you measure it, right? And then you can't go back to it. You don't know what happened. But if you have this history that you can go back to, you can actually trace out. So this is what I did. I had the end-to-end -end latency measurements and I had all the history of what happened to me available, or most of the history, which you know, made it harder uh, not having all the history and then figuring out what might have gone wrong, whether it was with m my way of measuring or whether it was with the w what the application was doing at that point in time and correlating that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, right. So it will happen in production, definitely. And also, you know, now we're getting into this gray area of like what happens if you can't write to the, you know, you losing the logs and it has its own set of challenges there. Um, the thing is that usually just writing to logs is infinitesimal compared to the rest of the other latencies you may have. And it can be just really not uh, taken into account, not uh, it doesn't, it shouldn't really worry you that much because well, the, well, the trade-off is, yes, it will slow your system down somewhat. The um, gain is that now you have full view into what's uh, happened in your system and you also can analyze you know, how it behaved and have a way to m reason about whether it got better and how much better it got. So there's definitely some trade-offs. So like if you're working in a very, high uh, in a very low latency uh, system, then uh, you may want to figure out. So like um, if you do distributed traces, you can just do sample of traces and uh, record instead of you know, every single action that happened, every single user request. Now you measure every thousands, every whatever fits your particular needs. Okay, good question. So how, uh, the question is, how do you decide when the JIT is warmed up? So, um, I th uh, well, in JVM, I believe there is um, there's flags you can pass to the um, uh, JVM that it will spit out to you when it goes uh, when it starts compiling, and when it uh, does decompiling. Um, also, the easiest way I think to do that is. Um, look at the performance measure and then see whether you started stabilizing and it's starting to reach steady state. Right. Oh yeah, so that one I think, so like at that point we exceeded the L3 cache, right? So now the next layer, we, now we're just starting to miss a lot and we're starting to look into the main memory, right? So, uh, into the um, RAM and then the main memory. So I think it was due to the fact that um, now we were missing a lot and we we're doing a lot of traffic looking up and then looking uh, into the next level.